name's Rob Hiley. I'm the composer of The Mole That Changed the World, along with another couple of people who contributed to the writing. Um, it's a show all about a global crisis called antimicrobial resistance. say a few things by way of introduction. So as you've heard, I've been GP now for about 30 years and extraordinarily fortunate, I think, to practice medicine in the era of antibiotics, but also distinctly worried that you know, whether I will finish my career still having that same access and opportunities to treat with antibiotics that I started with. This is what the mold that changed the world is all about. It's about Alexander Fleming, his his, the history of his discovery, him being part of the First World War and the Second World War, and it cycles through to get to the present day where we end up summing up this problem. I'm head teacher at Hitherfield. Hitherfield is a typical Lambert school. We've got 700 children, but we have a rich diversity of 45 known languages. <coughs> Um, a far away to the national percentage of children with uh, special educational needs. We, the ch older children put on a production at the end of their primary careers with us, and they normally do a sort of Bugsy Malone type thing, you know, the usual sort of West End productions. Um, but then this opportunity to do the mould came along, and I must say, you know, even though my children are extremely confident, um, the idea of doing a production about uh, micro my anti-microbial resistance, which isn't easy for me to say, um, even that made me think, my gosh, is this really the right thing? We must all use to drug when infected in bed. Penicillin is to cure to beat the steady threat. But if we overuse it, the infections will resist. Plus, we wipe out all the good bacteria that coexist. When they were asked, do you think the musical would make you use antibiotics differently? And that's the core purpose about this. Or to think about how you would use antibiotics in the future. One child said yes, because then it makes you think that if you if like your mum says to you, you might need antibiotics. You might think to yourself, hang on a minute, maybe I don't need antibiotics for this, and I don't need them. You would tell your mother that. So there was a huge amount of learning done. The fact that um, we learned uh, that you could overuse drugs and penicillin, and it could stop working, we, we just need to kind of just like use it properly and just kind of um, um, I, re I really believe that you should, yeah you can just overdose on things you can so not there's no drug that's necessarily perfect all, all drugs have their downside like they're naturally do what we've just seen what was great about this evening was it was a kind of combination of, of my background <coughs> and it was using the arts very powerfully I thought to describe something really important about science uh, and I thought it's also really important uh, in this age of ignorance uh, and misinformation that we find new ways of communicating uh, facts, uh, not alternative facts, the facts that we are sure of at the time that are backed up by science and evidence.
tell you about two cases that I've dealt with recently because they are recent and because they're real. Uh, and they both illustrate uh, things that happen commonly in hospital um, that are affected materially by antibiotic resistance or antimicrobial resistance. One is of a relatively young man in his 50s who had an elective, so not an emergency, uh, operation to replace a problematic knee he'd had for many, many years. Um, now, knee surgery is clean surgery. It's not uh, expected to be high risk of infection. A small proportion of people who undergo this operation will have infection. In order to reduce that risk, patients who have this operation tend to get a single dose of an antibiotic that's expected to lower the risk of the common infections uh, that happen in this setting uh, to closer to zero. Um, and this chap got the correct antibiotics at the right time, had his surgery, and went home and about his rehabilitation. But unfortunately, he came back in not long afterwards with infection, and to cut a long story short, the infection was resistant to the prophylactic antibiotic that he had received. Uh, no one could have predicted this. He didn't have particular risk factors that made anybody worried about this. Uh, he was a London resident. Um, he travelled a little bit, but nothing particularly alarming or uh, <coughs> exotic, um, and was a pretty average sort of guy. And he uh, unfortunately went on to have uh, a very serious infection of that knee, uh, requiring prolonged antibiotics, um, repeat operations, most importantly, to control the infection and remove the infection, remove the infected components and attempt to replace those components if they need. So I wanted to talk about how antibiotic overuse in farming, which is what we at the Alliance are campaigning against, how it really impacts us here in the city. Very important. So we heard a lot about how important it is to use antibiotics targetedly on individuals and to use a full dose. So these antibiotics that, that we would get, that you and I would get if we went to the doctor um, with a very bad infection. So of course it's uh, recognised these are the same antibiotics often being used in farm animals. So that's important. Um, also important is that farm animals are often given um, doses of antibiotics in groups, large groups. It's a preventative dose um, in the same way that we talked about preventative dose before at surgery, but in this case it's a large group of healthy animals given a preventative dose that they really don't need, and it's given um, in their feed or their water, and as I said, it's a lower dose. It's not enough to kill off all pathogens, it's only enough to kill off the sensitive pathogens. So really, what we're doing by preventative dosing healthy animals in this way is that we're just building up resistance to antibiotics, which is not very good. But for me, the key messages are pretty simple, really. They're about how we interact with our environment, how we make good decisions, about how we interact with it, about the food we buy, about the messages that we send back to our politicians, about how we think this is an important issue and we want to raise it up the agenda. I think we need to think about how we spread messages in a different way. There's something very important about that, but the other thing that's moved that on is policy that's linked to it. So policy is very much part of this as well. And we all take our own simple action, and I think we need to just hang on to that. Although, when you look at it at global scale, it seems a massive problem, and it seems a bit beyond any one of us to solve. But our collective action as individuals is a key component of how we will achieve that as well.